began researching Catholic topics, I had no idea where to start. Uh, I wanted to go really in depth to see what exactly was taught on a number of different theological issues, but I had a really hard time finding resources. In addition to searching for specific books, um, I would also try to find aggregated lists of recommended books that uh, if you're new to Catholicism or if you want to go deeper on a specific topic, here are the top 10 books we would recommend uh, people to find. I couldn't find any of those lists either. Um, so I, I was getting really discouraged. It was really frustrating to want to go deeper, but not knowing what materials could take me there. For the first few months, I ended up just reading a, a lot of Scott Hahn books. Um, he's quite famous and he's written quite a bit, uh, very many books. So if you Google a specific theological topic, chances are one of his books will pop up. So that's where I started. Um, his style is quite accessible. Uh, he's a, a former Protestant, so he knew where I was coming from. Um, so they were, they were quite helpful at the beginning. Um, but for most of those books, I, he didn't seem to drill down quite as deep as I was really looking for. So uh, I ended up looking for other resources after that. So that's what brings us to this video today. Uh, over the years, I've built up piles of books um, just by trial and error. Uh, a lot of them were complete wastes of time and money. Um, so I thought that I would make a video taking the best books that I've found, the ones that I really go back to on a regular basis, and compile them into the type of recommendations list that I looked so hard for many years ago, but I was not able to find. If there's anybody out there who is currently in a situation where I was many years ago and you just desperately want to find good books that will take you deeper on theological topics, hopefully this list will be able to help. I'll also try to include some links for each of these books that I talk about. Uh, some of them are quite old and a little bit difficult to find, so hopefully that'll make it easier for you as well. So here we go. The first thing that you're always going to want to have handy is a Bible. Uh, this is the one that I use. It's an ESV study Bible. Um, you're going to want to find a Bible that has a good concordance in the back. Um, that'll help you look things up. You can start by taking um, the title of your topic or words related to your topic and look it up in the concordance, and that will point you to areas of scripture where you can start your research. Also, as you move on to the other books that I'm going to mention, uh, as you work through your process of research, quite often they will reference passages of scripture, uh, either in a footnote or in the body of the text, but they won't actually quote the whole scripture. So it'll always be good to have this handy and go back to it, actually look up the full verse and read it in its context. Also, there are a lot of good online resources related to the Bible. Uh, one that I use quite a bit lately is called Bible Hub. Uh, a feature that they have there that I find particularly helpful is uh, you can go back, I think it's called interlinear maybe at the top of the page, but you can go back to the original language that that passage of scripture was written in, Greek or, or Hebrew, and then you can find a specific word in that original language and see where else that specific word in the original language was used, which will help give you context uh, regarding the meaning of the word and the context that it's usually used in. After that, next, uh, whatever topic that I'm researching, I'm going to want to know what the Catholic position is. And for that, I will go to the catechism. Throughout the catechism, it'll reference uh, various scripture passages, uh, like I just mentioned. So whenever I see those, I'll go back to the Bible and, and look those up. Uh, also, quite often the catechism will reference ecumenical councils um, where a teaching was put forward possibly quite a long time ago, and it might uh, reference that council where the teaching was defined, but it will talk about the teaching in a little bit more modern language here. Um, those ecumenical council documents are very important. Uh, put a pin in that for now. I'll come back to it uh, in a minute, what I do whenever I see a reference to those council documents. Another great resource for finding out what the Catholic position is, uh, is this book right here by Ott called Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. And the prior two books that I referenced, uh, the Catechism and the Bible obviously are uh, authoritative for Catholics in a way that this book isn't quite. Uh, 
Ott was a Catholic uh, priest and a theologian. Um, so this isn't necessarily the official position of the Catholic Church, but as far as I can tell, uh, Catholic theologians and apologists from all, all stripes, pretty much everybody that I've listened to or heard, if they talk about this book, uh, or if they talk about doctrine in general, they hold this book and Ott specifically in very high regard. Um, so I'm usually rather confident that uh, Ott is going to point me into the right direction uh, and that what he has to say about each of these different doctrines is going to be very close, if not exactly, what the official Catholic position is. This book has um, a good table of contents and also a subject index in the back. Um, so you can rather quickly find the specific topic that you're looking for. Uh, also within a specific section, it usually gives really good material, uh, background material about a topic, and then also describes how maybe a certain doctrine has progressed over time. Uh, quite often, similar to the catechism, it will reference uh, specific passages of scripture and ecumenical councils uh, that I'll handle the same way that I just mentioned with the catechism. So the next book in the lineup is extremely helpful when you do come to those ecumenical council documents that I mentioned a minute ago. It is called, well, actually it has a very long and complicated name, uh, but whenever I hear anybody talk about this book, they just call it Denzinger. So that's what I'm going to call it as well. This is a compilation of documents of the Catholic Church's magisterium going all the way back to the first century. Um, a lot of the original documents, uh, conciliar documents or, or other decrees, were obviously not originally issued in English. Um, so often you'll see here uh, the original language listed in one column and then a translation to English uh, in the column right next to it, which is very helpful. Whenever I see a reference to an ecumenical council, this is where I'll go to look up the document. Uh, for my purposes, the Council of Trent is extremely important. Uh, you've probably gathered that by now. And uh, all of the decrees from the Council of Trent are in here, uh, along with some really helpful information, uh, background information regarding the council. So at this point in the process, I'll usually have a pretty good feel for what the official Catholic position is on any specific topic. So the next set of books will be turning really to the Protestants' arguments on that topic. Uh, and this next set of books is probably one of the most helpful sets of books that I have found throughout this entire process. And it is these. It's called The Examination of the Council of Trent. It comes in four parts. Uh, it's written by a German theologian named Martin Chemnitz. These were written back in the mid to late 1500s. Uh, Martin Chemnitz was, uh, as I mentioned, a German theologian, but he also studied under Martin Luther. Um, in these documents, he goes through and addresses in detail uh, every section of the Council of Trent, responding to the arguments put forward in the Council of Trent, addressing the specific positions that were held in the Council of Trent, uh, this thing is extremely thorough, uh, and personally, I've found it to be really well thought through and will, really well reasoned as well. But I do want to pause here for a second uh, and give a, a bit of a warning regarding the tone that you're going to find in these. Uh, if you've ever read anything from the Protestant reformers, uh, Martin Luther, to an extent, John Calvin, uh, certainly John Knox, you're, you're probably going to discover a tone that's a little bit more aggressive than what we're used to today. Uh, let me read something really quick here to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. This is from the section uh, on sacred scriptures, page 46 of part one, if you end up getting the book. Uh, but he begins a paragraph off by saying, Lest I take more time reciting the abusive words of individual papalists against Holy Scripture. Now, some of you might not notice any tone at all in that, uh, or if you do notice the tone, maybe you like the tone. Personally, I cringe a little bit whenever I read something like that. Um, I had a professor in law school, uh, a legal writing professor, a class where you learn how to write like legal briefs and things you submit to court and things like that. 
and she said that whenever you feel yourself reaching for extreme language or wanting to use uh, like an exclamation point or some sort of punctuation to amp up your sentence, uh, your argument's not strong enough. You need to stick to the facts use only your words and not extreme language, but just use your words to show how strong your position is. Craft the facts using words in a way that whoever reads it will be absolutely sure that the position is correct. So that that's kind of how my brain is wired now. Um, so whenever I read something like this, that's kind of reaching for that more extreme type language, I'm just naturally skeptical. I'm not saying that Chemnitz doesn't have strong arguments. I, I think he absolutely does. It's just a bit of a battle for me against my personal default settings. Uh, when I read something like that, I naturally default into being skeptical. And it took me quite a while to get over that before I could really kind of skim off that tone and just really focus on the rest of the stuff that was being said in these books. And once I did that, I found these books to be extremely helpful. So if your default settings are anything like mine, uh, I would, I would urge you to push through your initial response. If you do dive into these books, try to push beyond uh, that first reaction that you get to the point where you can really see what the argument is. Uh, if you don't have the same default settings as me and, and you would like something like that or you don't see any problem with it at all, then it might even be more uh, accessible to you, easier for you to dive in and really start researching using these types of tools. Another similar type work that I'll usually turn to after I'm finished with this uh, is this by John Calvin. He did a similar type approach and responded to the Council of Trent. It's a document that he called the antidote to the Council of Trent. Uh, it's not this entire book, but it's contained in this book. Uh, and as you can see, just by the thickness of it, uh, if this is maybe a half or a third of this is the antidote to the Council of Trent, obviously this is not going to go into the same level of detail uh, or be quite as thorough uh, as the Shemnitz work is. But Calvin is a, is a different type thinker, uh, so I would definitely recommend uh, not skipping this and only going for Shemnitz, but really going for both of them, and that's what I usually do as well. The next resource that I will usually turn to uh, is also by John Calvin. Uh, it's called The Institutes, and that is right here. Institutes of the Christian Religion. So this is much more expansive than the book we looked at a second ago. Um, this does not only address the Council of Trent, it addresses many other issues in the Christian faith. Uh, this is really considered John Calvin's magnum opus. So if you get or read anything by John Calvin, it should probably be this. Um, because he was a Protestant reformer and lived during that time, quite often uh, he will uh, talk about, structure his arguments in a way that addresses the Roman Catholic position on a certain topic. Uh, he really will drill down in those areas, which I appreciate, uh, but this book is not only limited to those. After this, I will usually move to some systematic theology books. Uh, three of them that I've found particularly helpful are these three. Uh, the first one that I will talk about is this. It is Reformed Dogmatics by Bavink. This was recommended to me about a year ago by my pastor, so thank you for that. This has been very helpful. I believe this one was written in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, the next one that I'll turn to is this, Systematic Theology by Burkhoff. This was also written in the early 1900s, I believe. And then the last one that I'll usually turn to is a little bit more modern one called Systematic Theology by Grudem. Uh, I believe this one was written in the 1990s. Systematic theologies are, are really helpful because they, they organize theology by topic. Um, so I think most, if not all of these, have a, a good uh, table of contents in the front and then a, a subject index in the back. Uh, Burkhoff might not have the subject in index in the back, but uh, either way, uh, table of contents or otherwise, you can usually quickly find the specific area of theology that you're, you're looking to research. 
Uh, also, these books are a little bit different than some of the previous ones we've mentioned because they're not specifically structured around uh, Protestant and Catholic differences. And actually, at this stage in the process, that's usually quite helpful. Uh, let me give you an example of, of what I'm talking about here. So the Council of Trent addressed the topic of uh, transubstantiation in relation to the Eucharist. Uh, and as you're diving into all of these and really getting narrowly focused on what exactly is transubstantiation, why do Catholics believe in transubstantiation, things like that, you can get really narrow on the transubstantiation part. But at this point, it it's usually helpful to to get a broader view of the, the topic, uh, in this case, the topic of the Eucharist. So these types of books will be helpful in helping you think through what is the Eucharist? Why do we do the Eucharist or communion if you're, if you're a Protestant or the Lord's table? Uh, what is it? Why do we do it? Um, what is its role within the church? Uh, even broader than that, what are sacraments or ordinances? Why do we do those and what roles do those have? That's usually a really helpful thing to do at this stage in the process because you might be so narrowly focused on one specific aspect that there's another related aspect that you need to think through, but you're not going to see it until it's brought up in one of these type of books. So after these, I will usually turn to some more modern books that specifically focus on Protestant and Catholic differences. Two that I have really found to be helpful are these two here. Uh, this first one, uh, Roman Catholic Theology and Practice by Greg Allison. And then the second one is Roman Catholics and Evangelicals Agreements and Differences uh, by Geisler and McKenzie. These can also be used as reference books, uh, specifically looking at the, the area of doctrine that you're interested in. Uh, but another big benefit to these more modern books is that they will address topics that have been defined by the Catholic Church after, say, the Council of Trent. So this book will address those doctrines in a way that Chemnitz or, or Calvin or some of these other books that we mentioned uh, it either won't address at all or will address them uh, in a more specific way because the doctrine has been defined by the time this was written, but it wasn't defined at the time that those writings were produced. And then finally, I will usually finish up uh, my research on a specific topic by looking for a modern book that addresses just that topic specifically. This is where the Scott Hahn books that I mentioned at the beginning will usually come into play. Um, if you're looking for indulgences or a, a topic on Mary or, or something like that, just doing a search on that specific topic, usually one or two modern books will pop up as well. And those type of modern books uh, usually don't bring up uh, a new primary source uh, or a scripture passage or something that I'm not familiar with at this point, because usually those types of things will be brought up at the beginning of the process, either uh, in the Catechism or Ott or Denzinger or one of those. Uh, but what they will do is they will we'll talk about the topic in a more modern way. Uh, and oftentimes what's really helpful is they will use uh, a modern day analogy. They'll make an analogy that because it's referencing something in culture that we're familiar with, uh, it will help make that topic make more sense uh, in a way that some of these, the, the really old documents might, might not be able to do. So that's my process. And this is my list. This is my pile of go-to books. Um, hopefully, as I continue, I'll find some more. If you know of any that you find particularly helpful, please write me and let me know on the Protestant side or the Catholic side. I, I'm always looking for something new that will be helpful. And again, the, the purpose of this video really is to produce the type of resource that I really wanted to find a few years ago, and I just couldn't. Uh, and it was, it was a long, painful process. So hopefully, if any of you watching this are in a similar position, you really want to go deep, but you can't find resources to take you there. I really hope that this has been helpful.